Hello and welcome to another episode of Brave UX. I'm Brendan Jarvis, Managing Founder of The Space In Between, the home of New Zealand's only specialist evaluative UX research practice and world-class UX lab, enabling brave teams across the globe to de-risk product design and equally brave leaders to shape and scale design culture. Here on Brave UX, though, it's my job to help you to put the pieces of the product puzzle together. I do that by unpacking the stories, learnings, and expert advice of world-class UX, design, and product management professionals. My guest today is Lisa Maria Marquis. Lisa is the principal of The Future is Like Pi, an independent information architecture and content strategy consultancy that's on a mission to make it easier for people to find, understand, and act on information on the web. And while that's an admirable mission, it doesn't really tell the full story. Lisa's underlying goal is a bit bolder. She is, in fact, hell-bent on helping others to build digital experiences that empower users to make informed decisions, advocate for themselves and their communities, and change the world. Now that is a goal. And to achieve that goal, Lisa regularly works with well-known agencies such as Happy Cog and Brain Traffic. She also works directly with organizations such as Autodesk, the University of California, and Egghead.io, to name a few. Lisa is the author of Everyday Information Architecture, an amazing book that shows you how to leverage the principles and practices of IA in order to craft more thoughtful, <laughs> intentional, and effective digital spaces. On the topic of books, when Lisa's not helping her clients to create more empowering user experiences, she's the managing editor of A Book Apart, a highly respected publisher of professional books for designers, developers, and content creators. Full of energy, big ideas, and purpose, it's my great pleasure to have Lisa here with me on Brave UX. Lisa, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me on, and I apologize for sneezing in the middle of that amazing introduction. You sounded so professional and polished, and then I'm sitting there sneezing into the microphone. Well done. <laughs> Off to a great start. Thank you, seriously. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to have you here, and I'll, I'll toss up when I'm speaking to my editor afterwards whether or not we leave the sneeze <laughs> in there or not. You have to, because now I've mentioned it. Now I've, I've put a lampshade <laughs> on it. We have to keep it. <laughs> Lisa, there's something when I was doing my research for today that I was incredibly curious about. You might even think me slightly nosy. And that <laughs> is the story behind your LinkedIn and Twitter handle, which is Red Sesame. What is, what's the story there? Uh, actually, uh, surprisingly, a uh, pretty straightforward story, which is it is the official color of a Shiba Inu dog. That's it. That's That's it. End of story. Um, I uh, I have a Shiba Inu. I, I had a Shiba Inu before as well. This is my second Shiba. Uh, my first Shiba, his name was Nomad. Um, and I got him in 2005. And at the time, this was, this was before Doge. This was before Shibas had taken over the internet. No one knew what that dog was. <laughs> I'd never heard of the breed. And I absolutely fell in love with it. And I uh, uh, particularly was taken with the fact that the coloring pattern, uh, according to the American Kennel Club, was red sesame. I thought it was just a really clever, clever way of describing a sort of like orange, red, brown, black mix uh, in this particular breed patterning. And I just thought it was cool. And I loved my dog. And I was like, this is going to be my name. And so it is my handle anywhere I can get it on any social platform. It is how you can find me on Instagram. It's on Twitter. It's it's I don't know. <laughs> so, so it's not very exciting. <laughs> Well, it's it's fairly exciting, and if you want to find Lisa, you know where to, where and how to find her now. Red Sesame, don't Red forget Sesame. it. Now, there's another <laughs> there's another interesting. Well, I suppose this is a phrase rather than a word um, that I discovered in researching for today, and that was the name of your personal website and consultancy, <laughs> which is the future is <laughs> the like future pie. Future is like pie. Yeah, you know, and I was thinking about this. I was like, is this some sort of math joke that I'm mm -hmm. just not smart enough to understand? Like, what's the story there? Do you know, I, I almost wish it was, because I also feel like it's some sort of math joke that I'm not smart enough to understand, uh, which is partially why I chose it. So the story behind that is, the story behind that is that I actually, my career's been creative, like most people's. Um, and uh, before I was an information architect and content strategist, um, I actually started my career in academia. So I started out teaching. Uh, I 
particularly love to teach introductory writing courses uh, in university settings, which is a course that a lot of instructors hate because students hate them. <laughs> students <laughs> hate showing up and their first year of school, they're being told, okay, now go take this very basic intro to writing class. Uh, but frankly, a lot of students need a class like that because uh, there's a lot they're trying to pack into the first 12 years of their education. So how to write a college paper is not necessarily included in that education. So they sort of show up and need to, to get a crash course in using university libraries and making citations and writing words good. Uh, so, so I loved teaching that course because this actually dovetails, I think, with my interests now. It really was about helping people um, improve their communication skills. It really was about giving students the tools to um, you know, right? Yes, write better college papers, but really think better, think more critically, think more clearly, and communicate their thoughts more clearly. So that was I loved that that course. At any rate, uh, one of the semesters that I was teaching, one of my students wrote that sentence in a paper. Literally, it was they, the sentence they wrote in the paper was the future is like pie, comma it just keeps getting better and better. I don't know what it means. I don't know what does it mean. It it was just it. It blew my mind because it was so funny and it was so meaningless. It was nonsensical and it just tickled me. Uh, and the student did not get a good grade because it was pretty reflective of the rest of the paper. It was sort of a nonsense paper. I don't even remember what it was about or what the assignment was, but the phrase stuck to me. I just could not get it out of my head. And I thought sometimes you need to uh, see a, a funny phrase. Sometimes you need to see language used in a way that's very unexpected. Um, and that is that is what sticks with you more than the, you know, the pages, pages of papers I, I graded that were excellent. I don't remember those, but boy, do I remember that that one student's one sentence. Uh, so why not adopt it for for my entire business? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully that student never tracks you down and requests some royalties. For, for, for. <laughs> now you've got a master of fine arts and English from Cornell and I'm about to make a terrible pun and that's not a university to be sneezed at. Right? Oh no. Like, that's a very serious, oh. I know, I know. Oh, I thought I'm, about that. I'm, I'm, I even I'm leaving. I'm, I'm hanging up right now. I'm leaving. <laughs> okay. Right. We've got Lisa back. I managed to convince <laughs> her to return. So we'll pick up from where where we left off before sure, I sure uh, sure before I, I stormed out angrily yeah <laughs> clearly the written word something that's important to you I mean you were just explaining how you used to to teach you used to be a lecturer and and teach people how to write which is something that is a bit of a shame that people didn't know how to do when they arrived at university but you're also an author and you're a poet what is it that you enjoy most when it comes to the written word? Is it editing? Is it writing? Is it speaking your poetry aloud? What is it? Oh, not that last one for sure. <laughs> so we won't um, be doing that. So we're not doing that. <laughs> not not this time, maybe next time. That's such a great question. I mean, I there's this knee jerk reaction to say, oh, but I just, I love writing. I love every aspect of it. And then there's simultaneously the other knee the other knee-jerk reaction is, I hate writing. Oh God, everything about it is awful. Um, and somehow both of those uh, both of those exist in me at the same time, which is probably true of a lot of folks. I came to love writing through poetry. That is that is what I was always drawn to throughout my childhood, throughout my teen years, throughout my twenties. I loved finding ways to use language to convey an emotion and to to convey an emotion in a way that surprised people and yet resonated with them at the same time. I, I really loved finding turns of phrase and, and ways of juxtaposing words that, that we don't normally see in everyday language, trying to find really unusual and interesting ways of expressing universal feelings, things that we, we all knew. You know, no one writes new things really ever, right? We write the same stories. We love the same stories. We like to read the same stories. We are often writing the same plots over and over in, in novels. We are often writing many of the same observations, but we're always doing it in different ways. We're always coming up with new ways of saying something old. And I, I think that is a really interesting challenge when it comes to writing. I, I love that aspect of it. So poetry was a really good way to really drill down on those particular aspects while also still paying attention to how you communicate to a reader, how you take other people's interests into consideration as you're writing. Poetry is, a, a lot of people dislike poetry because it's 
art because it's it's kind of uh, arm's length. You know, we don't we don't know we have, oh. We don't always know how to approach it because sometimes it is written in ways that do seem kind of inscrutable or, or are confusing or feel like they, they keep the reader out. Um, I think there's many different kinds of poetry. I think there is a kind of poetry for every reader out there. I, I think it is silly. I will say to dismiss poetry as a genre to say, it's not for me. I don't, it's like saying it's, I don't like music or, or I don't like, you know, like what there's, there's a, there are certain kinds of music everyone hates. There are certain kinds of music. Everyone, everyone has their thing and it's the same with poetry. So I, I think there are poems that definitely keep readers out and I don't like those as much. I like poems that invite the reader in and think about how to communicate these ideas or these feelings to, to a reader. So that's what I like about, poetry. Now, somehow through that, I found my way to writing prose and, and nonfiction and writing a book about information architecture. Um, I don't quite know how that happened. Seems, it seems accidental in some ways, like I tripped and fell into this manuscript. But uh, when it comes to writing prose, I will say I do hate that. I do, <laughs> I do dislike it. I don't like writing um, in the sense that it's, it's hard. I am working on another book right now. So I <laughs> clearly... Clearly, I don't actually hate it, or I wouldn't still be doing it. I'm just saying that I hate it because it's sort of a slog. But I, I, I really love editing. That's my favorite thing mm. because I was going to ask you about that actually. Yeah, please. Well, tell me. It will tell me. Finish your thoughts. Sorry, oh. please. What is it that you love about it? <laughs> well, editing to me is much easier than writing because uh, writing you have to generate something from the blank page. Editing, there's already something there to work with. And I, I like having something to work with because if I've got the words there, I know how to rearrange them. I know how to replace them. I know how to strengthen them. I know how to reorder them. But if you're looking at the blank page, that's just like, oh, now I got to generate something from scratch, from nothingness, from thin air. That's, again, a lot of pressure. So uh, yeah, editing, that's a bit editing's where it's at. <laughs> well, t let's talk about editing. What is it like editing books of other practitioners in the field that you respect, like Erica Hall and Dan Brown? Oh, oh, it's, it's delightful. It's, uh, it's intimidating. Sure. It was Dan Brown was one of the, the first books I edited uh, when I started editing with a book apart um, many years ago. And, uh, and it was very intimidating to be like, but Dan Brown, but Dan Brown, <laughs> and uh, Erica Hall. Also, that's a, a great person to call out. Um, I, I love working with all of our authors. They are all just like really fantastic people. And I particularly love that a book apart works with such a range of uh, types of authors. It's, it's sometimes it is like these, these big, uh, impressive, fancy, intimidating people like Erica Hall. Um, and other times it's, it's someone you've never heard of before. And this is their first book. This is their first time doing a, a sort of putting their ideas out publicly um, and, and everyone in between. So it's really wonderful to experience that kind of range and to see that different people bring such different things to their books, like different, different authors have different strengths and they have different weaknesses. And so sometimes it's surprising to, to see what one person struggles with that the next author has absolutely no problem with, but they struggle with something else that the previous author didn't. So uh, every author is a little bit different and uh, it's really fun to sort of figure out what is it that this person is particularly good at and how can we lean into that? How can I help make them even better at that thing? And how can I help them improve at the things they aren't as, as strong in? How can we make this book into, this is what I always tell people, we're trying to make the book into the best possible version of itself that it can be. We're not trying to take someone's book and turn it into a different book. We're not trying to take an idea and fit it into, you know, be a book apart mold. Sure, we have a way of doing things. Every publisher does. But we want to start with a book where the core idea already kind of aligns with our values and the way we're, we're moving as a publisher. So that's one of the exciting things to me with editing other people is getting to see this kind of variety, getting to see these different skills and ideas, getting to help people shape ideas that become uh, so important to the industry. You know, putting out, for instance, Conversational Design by Erica Hall, that book broke some ground and no one else has written a book that, that touches on this subject in quite the same way um, since then. And so to see these books start from bad first drafts, right? Everyone writes a bad first draft. Everyone writes a bad first draft. To see it in that bad first draft and then later realize, my God, people are like quoting this. This is like, this is the book. This is the the tome on this particular topic is really cool. It's, I love editing. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah. And you play an active role in that as the editor. Before we move on to IA, 
I wanted to ask you, how do you know when a book is ready to send to the printer? How do you know? When is it ready to press that button? When I when are you ready? <laughs> Gosh, I phrase that terribly. Let me start again. <laughs> When do you know if an author is ready to send their book to be published? That's such a great question because surprisingly sooner than you would expect, I think, is the answer. There are so many, people don't realize this necessarily unless they've been through the, the book writing process before. There are so many phases in the editing process that by the time we actually send that manuscript to the publisher, it's been ready to go for weeks so there's never, there's never like this moment of decision where it's like, is it ready or not? We got to, we got to decide and we got to click the button. We got to do this. It's being polished. So at like an increasingly granular level, so many times that it doesn't, there's no switch there, right? It's not like a, a, a hard line. It's more of a gradual shaping as it sort of comes into itself. That said, I think the question you're really asking is like, what is that? What does that transition look like? Right. Um, how do you how do you get from that bad first draft into something where you're like, ah, this is this is becoming a book? Um, or is there I, a feeling that you get as an editor or, or an author? You know, like do you reach this sort of nirvana of calm and 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 wonder at your own amazingness, I, and you're like, now we're ready? I I do. I I can't speak for other authors and and editors, but yeah, there's like this moment. I would say there's definitely a feeling where I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, this. This feels good. This feels right. Um, but it happens frequently, right? It's, it's not like this one moment on one book. It's like there's a moment during the developmental edit process during the first round where I'm like, ah, okay, yeah, this is, we have been through the first round of dev edits and it is ready to go back to the author or, or this author has finally, you know, made this this piece of the book fit correctly and it feels right to me. So there is a, a, a sort of gut feeling that happens a question a lot of uh, authors tend to ask, especially uh, if it's their first time writing a book, is they ask, how do I know when it's ready to like turn in? <laughs> like, when is that first draft ready? And what I always tell them in that case is it's ready. It's, it's done being its first draft, right? It's ready to turn into your editor when you can't take it any further on your own. Because writing a book is a collaborative process. Like it is very much about the author and their ideas, but that editing is about a conversation between the editor and the author. And you don't want to give that book over to the editor if you are still trying to work through something, if you're still trying to think through a concept and work it out on the page. It's ready to go to that editor when you have, when you reach that point, maybe, maybe that nirvana point you're talking about when you're like, ah, okay, there's nothing else I can give to this book. Someone else needs to carry it a few more steps. And of course, as soon as you do that, the moment you send it to the editor, you're going to realize, oh, shoot, there were all these other things I wanted to do. <laughs> there, were, there was this other problem I never resolved. And there was this paragraph I forgot to add and et cetera. But you look for that moment where you're ready to get feedback, where you're ready to take someone else's perspective and add it to your own and, and sort of commingle of those ideas. And writing strikes me and editing strikes me as a, a process of a lot of critical thinking that goes into it. And you're an information architect as well and content strategist. And as I mentioned in your introdu introduction, that you've worked for some quite amazing organizations, a couple that I didn't mention, for example, at Carl Carnegie Mellon University and the Associated Press. When you are engaged by these organizations to come and help them with their information architecture and content strategy, generally speaking, how sure are they about the problem that they have, their perceived problem, by the time that you arrive? Oh, good question. With a varying answer. <laughs> I I think I have definitely worked with some clients who definitely knew the problem that they were facing and absolutely understood what they needed and, and they just needed, you know, more hands on deck or they just needed someone else from outside the organization to come in and say exactly what they were saying. But I would say the majority of folks I work with don't necessarily know the problem they are dealing with. And part of the engagement is helping them to articulate what it is that they are trying to solve for. And it's very different depending on, you know, if, if I'm hired to work on a website redesign project, that's a pretty clear, <laughs> like that's, you know what the problem is. We need a new website. Great. Cut and dry. But the stuff that comes up while you're working on it, those are the problems they weren't necessarily articulating, or those are the problems that they didn't necessarily know were going to be problems. So when you run into issues like, well, we need this website redesign, but we don't have anyone to write the content. Well, that's that's a different problem. That's a completely different problem. Or, you know, we need this website redesign, but, uh, you know, 
X stakeholder over on team Y is insisting on this thing happening and it's really not part of our thing. And, you know, it becomes when you get those problems that kind of spiral out into organizational messes, that happens sometimes. Yeah. And as the, as the consultant in that relationship, how do you do that dance with your clients and the rest of the organization to help them to see what it is that needs to be done without them feeling threatened or, you know, getting people offside that you actually need to collaborate with? Yeah. Great question. It depends. In some cases, to speak generally, it is about collaboration, right? And bringing people along for that process of diagnosis, right? And making sure that, making sure you're not, as a consultant, you're not swooping in to be like, well, here's what's wrong with you. You know, that, that doesn't <laughs> go over well, you know, it, pointing out like, here are all the things that are wrong with your website. God, I wish that were my job. Honestly, I wish I could just like show up and be like, you did this wrong. You did that wrong. You did this other thing wrong. Here are the 40 things you did wrong in this spot. Because that's so fun, right? To just feel right all the time. Like who doesn't want to do that? To just be like, oh, I know better than you. And I am so smart. That would feel great. But that uh, is not realistic. It is not sustainable. It is not fair. It is not kind. So in terms of how do we bring people along for that? It's it's less about pointing out what's wrong and a lot more about helping the people who are doing the work to articulate what they need um, and really trying to get conversations going and try to get people there to talk to each other. Because a whole lot of the time, that's that's part of the problem, right? Is there's like some kind of internal dysfunction somewhere. Certain teams don't talk to each other or they do, but it's it's hostile or whatever. So Try to figure out how to get conversations to happen and try to figure out how to get folks to understand where they can, where, where we can make improvements to their process or to their tools that will make their jobs easier and still make them feel valued. This stuff's complicated because people have so many different ways of tying their, their personal value and, and, and their identity up in their work and in their jobs. And so you know, there are certainly times when you think you're making someone's job easier and what they're hearing is you're trying to make me redundant, right? You're trying to take my job away or you're trying to make me less important. And that's tricky. You know, how do we how do we accommodate that? I don't have an answer, right? It's just sort of you got to watch out for those things because things that you might see as an as an outsider being, oh, this is so simple. We can just solve it like this. It's not always going to feel that way internally. So, so much of being a consultant is shutting up and listening. <laughs> And then, and then being very careful about when you speak. That's, that's part of it. Yeah. It's, so when you're brought in directly to an organization, you know, what is the, the type of client that, that goes, Hey, I, I want to work with Lisa. Is this like the head of design? Is it a chapter area lead? Like who is it that you're generally engaging with? Oh, it varies widely. Yeah, for sure. One of my recent clients, I was working with a, a sort of product marketing team. Recently, I was working with uh, some heads of content. A couple of years ago, I worked with a developer. <laughs> you know, like that was the per the point person who brought me in. So it does vary a lot depending on what it is that they're looking for and uh, sort of how, the makeup of the organization and how digitally mature they are, kind of where they are in their content journey. Everyone's different these days. And that relationship between IA and content that you've just touched on there, mm -hmm. you know, these things seem like their success is so mutually dependent. How do you think about the distinction, if any, between what's content strategy and what's information architecture? Oh, the the question of the century. Um, <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> we found it. You know, there is so much value to being able to define things and have shared understandings across the industry of what these things are and where they start and stop. And, you know, like, let's get some nice clear boundaries. And at the same time, it's so varied and it changes so much from organization to organization and context to context that like, in some ways, is it even, even useful to answer this question? Um, <laughs> I think it's, I mean, Damn I think it's worth, I think it's worth discussing. It's just that, you know, there's not like, ah, this is the definition of where content strategy yeah. stops and IA starts. You know, I sort of did the weird thing of getting to IA through content strategy, which is not common, um, only because IA was sort of brought up as a discipline before content strategy was. And so a lot of folks either kind of dabble in both as, as they came up or, you know, definitely went one way or definitely went the other way. I got really into content strategy and then I was like, oh, what's this over here? Wait, you mean I can just like 
tell people how to make better sitemaps, great, I'm going to do that. Because I, I ultimately, <laughs> you know, I, I love content strategy, but I am ultimately not someone who really wants to help you <laughs> figure out what kind of content you should be writing or the role that the content plays in the overall business like that. And that is, that's really what content strategy is, is focusing on is sort of the intersection between what's being published and how the business operates, which I can do, but it's not my favorite. <laughs> I am much more interested in, you know, the experiential side of things and how people are navigating information spaces, which content is very much a part of content is kind of why we go to websites. So I care a lot about the content and I care about the strategy behind the content and how that intersects with the constructed environment of the, of the information, but it's an intersection, right? It's, and it's, there are many points of intersection there and people can work at those different points of intersection or they can completely avoid them. I think it's better when we, you know, talk, uh, when, when those different teams talk, but a lot of organizations don't have, uh, dedicated content people or dedicated IAs or even, one of those things. Sometimes they have neither. Um, some teams only have UX people. Some pe teams only have content designers, some of whom do IA. There's just a lot of variety. I think what matters is that do you have people who are thinking through, thinking critically through the experience of interacting with that information, interacting with that content? What does that feel like to, to your audience and to your users? And as long as you are trying to solve for that experience, as long as you are trying to improve that experience, you can call yourself whatever you want. You can be an IA, you can be a content strategist, you can be a content designer, you can be Joe Schmo. I don't care. <laughs> just just make make the website good, please. Make the words good on the website. Yeah, well, I get the sense, though, that a lot of UX designers, which is a very broad term, which could sure. encompass product design with, with, with visual, the visual aspects of that, as well as sort of the underlying architectural uh, aspects of design. But I get the sense that we're far more comfortable putting together prototypes and wireframes than we are thinking critically about the structure of the information and the labeling of our categories and whether or not mm -hmm. those things contain bias, how findable our content is. You know, all of these um, big, big questions that have been part of the field for a long time, that seems to me at least that they have somewhat been glossed over in recent years and there isn't really the same emphasis that there used to be on the importance of these things. Why is it that as a, as a broad field of design at the moment, we seem to struggle with IA so much and realizing just how strategic it can be and useful for our products? <laughs> Gosh, why wouldn't we do the hard thing? That's a weird, that's weird that that's happened, that we're all picking Are you going to say that answer. people are lazy? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> people, you know, it's not even that they're lazy, honestly. It, it's that people are scared. I think, mm. I think people are tired. People are just trying to get through the day, man. <laughs> and that, that is really what it comes down to. Um, so yeah, I, I don't say that as like a, a personal recrimination of anyone. You know, I, it's, it's not about, Oh, we're all just doing a bad job. We are all doing a bad job. We're all doing a super bad job, <laughs> every single one of us, um, because that's how humans are, right? Humans are just not actually very good at things, and so it's really no surprise to me that you know it's it's much easier for us to go to conferences and listen to these talks and rally around these big ideas about how we're going to make things better for users, and then we go back to our jobs and we just keep doing what we're doing because we don't, we don't feel empowered to make the change or we could make the change, but it's really hard. Like, like not like, not like a, a logistically hard, like it's hard to make a wireframe. It's not hard to make a wireframe. That's why we keep making wireframes because it's easy to make wireframes, but it might be hard to call out your boss or it might be hard to, you know, experience a conflict with someone on another team, or it might be hard to push back against a company policy that's making something different, you know? So the problem is that we are individuals and we are embedded in systems that are so much bigger and more powerful than we are that it is very easy to it is very easy to to talk a big game and then find it very difficult to to actually push for change or make change happen so i think that's why you know i don't know i I get down about this. I get down about this topic a lot, you know, as I, as I write another conference talk to talk about how we need to improve things and, you know, go to bat for users and make the internet a better place. And, and I'm like, well, I've been giving 
the same theme of a talk now for how many years have I been working and what's changed? I still have to keep going to conferences and I still have to keep delivering these talks. And I'm relatively new to, to the industry. You know, when you think about it, there are people who've been giving these talks for, for 30 years or 40 years. Um, how long has the internet been around? And boy, we just keep needing to hear the same things over and over and we keep not changing. So it's, it can, it can get me down. It can get me down. I'm sure it gets other people down too. So the question is, what do we do? Yeah, that? well, how, I mean, how do we avoid about, despair? <laughs> yeah, well, like if we, if we, we let's hold that despair there. That's a very real thing. Like, let's not, um, let's not gloss over that. I, I definitely get that sense, and I get that sense from, you know, people that have been in the industry for longer than we have as well. You know, like I spoke with Peter Morville a few weeks back on the podcast, and he's feeling pretty down as well. And he he sort of laid down the challenge to designers that we need to realize that we have power and that we are activists and we need mm -hmm. to do something. Yes. with that so it's definitely echoed elsewhere but sure. you're someone that's quite comfortable in at least outwardly in in your own shoes having a voice being brave and not just saying things but acting on that what is it that's given you that confidence that courage to have the voice that you do in this industry oh wow i'm really honored by you saying that thank you that's uh that's sort of taken me by surprise a bit because i don't feel confident um, and I don't, I don't feel particularly brave. I think what little bravery you're witnessing is actually just privilege. I, I think that I am in a position where I've suffered no repercussions for saying whatever I want because I don't have an employer. <laughs> I'm a consultant. So like, I don't have to worry about getting fired because I'm trying to unionize. I don't have to worry about getting fired because I said the wrong thing on Twitter. I don't have to worry about, you know, having something taken away from me because of, of what I'm saying on social media. And a lot of folks do. A lot of folks have that, that challenge or maybe they're not worried about getting fired, but you know, works just become harder for them. They're not getting as much, you know, they, they don't have as much leeway in what they're doing or, or whatever. So there are a lot of challenges that go into speaking up that, that I just don't have to encounter. So I'm lucky I'm privileged. And that is, let's not mistake privilege for bravery, right? Um, bravery would be if I am sacrificing something to speak up and I'm not sure that I am. So I don't know. That's something to think about too. Mm, yeah, it most definitely is. That's given me a lot to think about, actually. <laughs> well, I mean, let's actually, this will bring us to something that I know that from listening to your current conference talk, that what I perceive to be your bravery shone through really strongly. And this is to do with categorization. Mm. And like, we're going, we're going to go deep here, people. So settle <laughs> in, get, get comfortable. Buckle up, buttercup. Here we go. What I am trying to to find here is this re reference to this gentleman's name, and it's mm. Walter Ashby Plecker. Mm. Just in case anyone was under any illusions that the choices that we make on a daily basis in design about the categories and the labels that we use in our information in our information architecture can have wide ranging conference. Uh, consequences. Lisa, tell us who was Walter Ashby Plecker and what choices about categories did he make and what were the impacts of those choices? Oh, dude sucks. Uh, <laughs> Walter Plecker. Uh, Walter Plecker uh, is a dead racist, dead American racist. Um, and he was around in the uh, early half of the 20th century. He was a bureaucrat and he was responsible in the state of Virginia, Commonwealth of Virginia. Sorry, it's not a state, it's a commonwealth. I grew up in Virginia, so I know this. He was responsible for changing the state's census categories for race. So whatever categories for race existed before, he flattened them. There were only two racial categories on the Virginia census after Walter Plecker got a hold of it. White and black. That was it. That was that was it. Those were the only options you could possibly be. And in order to qualify as white in that category, um, it had to be like, it was really a very specific kind of basically white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. <laughs> like you were, you were just, you were basically a British descendant and that was it. And literally everything else got thrown into the other bucket. And so this had so many effects on like just absolutely upended lives, really, really hurt people 
for a long, long time as a result of this decision. A couple of things that came out of this. One, anyone who was in the Black category could not access most public services all of a sudden. This was in the 1920s, uh, just to, to clarify, 1920s. So so not that long ago, right? Not that That's long 100 ago. 100 years ago. 100 years ago. Um, and continued for several decades, so less than 100 years ago. And uh, so they, they couldn't access certain social services, could not go to the same schools that they were going to before. People could not get married to someone from another race. So all of a sudden, people who were married, uh, if they fell into different categories, their marriage was annulled. Like the state was just like, just kidding, you're not actually married. Uh, just kidding, you can't actually live together. Just kidding, you can't parent your children anymore. People who were of uh, other ethnic backgrounds no longer could even claim those ethnic backgrounds. So if you were an indigenous person in Virginia, you weren't indigenous anymore. All of a sudden you were labeled black. That was it. That was the category you got. And so as a result, another result was people who were part of the first families of Virginia, the, the original inhabitants of Virginia, just no longer had any kind of indigenous claims, no longer had any kind of tribal rights. The state did not recognize them being who they were. And so that meant, we just have these domino effects here. Because of that, decades went by where they had no records. There was nothing on, there, no government documentation that could tie them back to who they were. And here's the best part, we didn't undo this until 2016, right? So, or whatever year it was, I forget. It's in my book. I think it was 2016. Pretty recently, pretty, pretty friggin' recently, a couple of years ago, Congress, the, the actual like Congress of the United States had to undo this. And everyone who's a descendant of the folks who this originally happened to, now they have to do all this, all this extra bureaucratic work to try and prove their identities. So it just fucked up a lot of shit. Okay. Like that is really yeah. like, and like on like a massive scale. Yes. We're only talking about one state, but I'm positive. This is not the only place where this happened. We're talking about one state. We're talking about one law. We're talking about one, one census. We're talking about one dude in one position in one government. And yet millions of people's lives completely changed in terms of their day-to-day -day quality of living in terms of what their descendants have to deal with in terms of who they are and how they prove that. I mean, Maybe we don't think that that's that big of a deal if we are a uh, part of the majority population and we've never really had to worry about like using government documentation to prove who we are. But like, if, if you don't have government documentation to prove who you are, you are nothing. You are no one uh, from from the government's perspective. You know, from from how you can move through the world um, because our identities, our bodies, our political entities. You know, these are these are things that the government and society kind of. Uh, uses to to manage <laughs> our lives. And so you have to have something that that expresses that. So it sucks. It sucks. This one dude just shows up and he's like, I'm just going to change some categories on a piece of paper. And this is what happens for decades and decades and decades afterwards. Wow. That, yeah. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so, so when we talk about you know, we kind of throw this, the, this, this, this phrase away quite lightly, you know, making the world a better place as designers. Walter Plecker was a, an information architect and he was a designer and he objectively made the world a terrible place for a lot of people by robbing them of their identity. Mm -hmm. So we should really think about even the smallest decisions that we're making and I suppose try and be mindful of things that we're doing and what the downstream effects might be. It seems that he did that with great intention. But there are a lot of other things. I don't know if you're seeing this still, but I mean, I was on a bank website recently. Or I think it was an insurance website and I was signing up for a policy and they still only had two gender options, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know? So when you think about that uh, in particular, and I wanted to ask you about this, there's also yeah. this sort of rejection of the binary uh, mm -hmm. gender at the moment that's mm -hmm. going on. And historically, we've just had male and female. This has caused a lot of people to lose their minds about extending gender categories past the two that people have been familiar with. A lot of conservatively minded people have just completely lost their shit on this. <laughs> Why has it caused such a fuss? Like, what is it about people? Like, maybe politics aside, mm. why is it causing so many people to lose their minds? <laughs> why are conservatives? I can't answer that, man. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Um, I mean, it, kind of the same answer I gave before, which is, again, fear. Um, people mm. people are afraid of change. This is a very textbook answer, but probably is sort of what it is. It's threatening to some people 
to have the world presented differently to them than they thought it was. Uh, to to have something that they think of as so static and unchanging suddenly have people who you don't know, who you don't like, who don't look like you, who don't sound like you, who might be decades younger than you suddenly saying, actually, you're wrong. That's difficult to hear, sure. And the thing is, too, I think that it's very tempting, again, to look at people like that, to look at people who are very conservative and very afraid of change, and to look at them derisively, which, and I do, <laughs> it's it's very easy to do. And uh, I have no, no sympathy or pity for racists or transphobes or anything. So, uh, you know, fuck them. But also, these multiple truths can be true at the same time here. But also, it is hard to hear that things are different than you expect. And it is hard to hear that you are wrong about something. It is hard to hear that you have fucked something up, that you have, it is, it is easier to push the whole thing away than it is to try and accept that you've made a mistake and accept that you have to change the way you are moving through the world. Uh, if you understand gender to be one of two things, and it's been like that for 60 years that you've been on the planet and you get told, well, this person isn't a boy. This person is non-binary. You're like, what, what the, what? <laughs> like, this is yeah. not, this is not a thing you can really like, in order to understand that you have to be someone who is always actively trying to change or always open to change. And, and most people aren't. So I, I just try to, while I don't have sympathy or love for, <laughs> for people who are reactionary that way, I also do try to understand where they're coming from and, and try to figure out how can we maybe change the way we approach the and that's not for everyone to do that's for someone like me to do because i have privilege and i am safe and i can do that so i am comfortable trying to think about it but but here's another thing i want to say about it here's another thing i want to say i'm going to try to like make a connection here i think we all do this a little bit we are all conservative in something we all have a reaction to something that's but no that's not how i understand the world that's not we might think we are very progressive and liberal and open to change and all of this, but like, there's always going to be something. And I'm going to give you an example that literally just happened to me this past week. Okay. Which is, I saw an article, uh, fairly recent. I forget when it came out fairly recent. I think it was on Vox. I saw an article that was talking about the suburban family tradition of apple picking. I assume, I assume people apple pick in New Zealand. I don't know. <laughs> but you go apple picking, I assume right? so. Yeah. I've in, not done it, but I assume the there's fall, someone here that does. <laughs> in the fall, you and your family get in your minivan and you drive out to a farm and you pick some apples and you buy them and you take them home. And now you have a bunch of apples and it's like a fun fall tradition. And it is a tradition that I grew up with. Uh, my family went to the apple orchard every fall. I freaking loved it. It was one of my favorite things to do to this day. I love fall. I love autumn. It is one of my favorite seasons. And that is one of my favorite activities. This article was talking about how actually apple picking is agritourism and that it erases the labor of immigrants and that it uh, is sort of like, it's it's class warfare basically. And I had a very strong reaction to that, right? I had a very like, uh-uh, <laughs> like, don't, don't you tell me that that's, but it's my, but I like it. I like doing it. You can't tell me that it's a bad thing to do when I like doing it. Um, oh, th no. That is the reaction I had. Uh, now, I also can recognize that that article is probably absolutely right, right? You know, I, I can read that article and I can be like, I see exactly what they mean. I see exactly where they're coming from. And there are, there are some issues I am going to have to dig into deeper on that. And I want to read more about it and I want to learn more about it. But I also recognize, hey, I had this reaction. I had this very conservative, I don't like change. This is my habit and my part of my identity and part of my culture, right? Like this is something I've done my entire life. So why would I readily accept that maybe it's actually bad? You know, why is, so I just, I just thought this is a good example of like, here's something that's, you know, it's not the same thing as like maybe being transphobic, but uh, it, you know, I had a very conservative reaction and we all do. And so I think it's important to kind of notice when we have those moments and figure out, well, what do I need to do to, to hear things differently? And can I apply that lesson to reaching out to other people who have that reaction in other ways? Yeah, there's almost this need, and I, I assume this exists on both sides of the political spectrum, whether you're liberal or conservative, this need to be seen 
or to feel like you're the perfect mm. liberal or the perfect conservative. And if, of course, if we know, have, have, have heard or have seen anything in this conversation so far is that there are many mm. shades of grey <laughs> and that having a binary approach to, to life in itself can cause people a lot of frustration and angst. Yes. So something like Walter Plecker's choice that he made around white and black as categories Very binary. for putting, <laughs> putting humans in, right? Very binary, right? And yeah. it's, it's easy to, with the benefit of hindsight, look back on that decision and that person and say, terrible fucking decision, what sure. we're thinking of. Like, clearly it's not, it's not right and it should never have happened. But as we think about that and reflect on our daily practice as information architects and the choices we have to make around categorization and labels mm -hmm. on the information that we're presenting to the world, to our users, is it completely, is it possible to avoid harm completely in the work that we do? No. Um, <laughs> there's your answer. I think what we are aiming for is not perfection. Again, that's that's binary thinking, right? Either the decision you've made is good or bad, and that's not true, right? What we are aiming for is iteratively better, continual improvement, the arc of the universe bending toward justice. That's That's what we're going for. So I don't think we should be aiming for perfection in our daily habits. I think aiming for perfection is too much pressure, and I think that is a good way to to give up quickly and to get derailed and to fall into despair. I think we need to be working on, have I made this better than it was before? Have I improved life for someone? Have I made the experience of this product or this website a little bit better for a vulnerable group? That's what we can, we can do that. Every single one of us can do that, right? Even if we are stuck in a, in a difficult, overwhelming system, even if we are just one person in an organization that feels really entrenched in, in reactionary ways of thinking, or really entrenched in not thinking, we can do something. We can we can all make one tiny, tiny indent. And that's great. Because if we can all make one tiny indent, that's a pretty big change. Um, so that's my hope. Uh, not, not to aim for perfection, but to aim for improvement. So if we're not aiming for perfection and we, we find ourselves making decisions about categories and labels, what is it that you do or that you would like others to do more of that can help them think through what the intended and unintended consequences of some of those trade-offs they're making in, mm -hmm. in terms of the labels that they're applying to the information they're trying to describe. Hmm. See, the thing about Walter Plecker is that he thought he was doing something good for his definition of good, right? Like he, he, he wasn't, he's not a cartoon villain, you know, he's not sitting there like, ha 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 ha, I'm going to do the bad thing now. He's, He's saying, I want the world to look like this. This is a design choice I'm going to make in order to achieve that. So for his bullshit racist definition of good, he did good. That's a problem because when we realize that, we realize we are all capable of that. We are all capable of, of building harm into our products, even when we're not wanting to, or, or even, you know, even when we think we're doing absolutely the best thing. So it's, um... It's a complicated thing and we have to really take active steps to ensure that we are doing the best we can. It is not something that will ever happen by accident or, or just as a byproduct. It has to be something we actively build into our processes. I think everyone, when they are making any decision uh, when it comes to design, should be thinking of the most vulnerable person they can imagine, right? The, the person who has the most to lose in this interaction and figure out what is the way that that this is going to harm them? How is this going to hurt them? How can someone use this against them? That's that's a good first step. I also think this is a great moment to plug someone's book. I, I would like to plug Design for Go Safety. For yeah, Design for Safety by Eva Penzimug. Uh, we just released that from a book apart a couple of months ago. And it is phenomenal in terms of providing instruction for exactly this. Um, for really thinking through what are the unintended negative consequences? How is this going to harm a vulnerable user? She's got some really important practical advice in there about making that a part of everyone's practice. Now, I haven't read the book, but I've just been joining a few dots in, in my head uh, from this conversation. You know, Lisa, you're an editor. We've talked about the importance of critical thinking. We've talked about uh, your career in academia before you came to the field of IA and UX and content. What role, if any, should or is editing playing in the design decisions that we're making on a daily basis? 
Oh, well, I've always said that editing is just information architecture and vice versa. They're, they're the same <laughs> from my perspective, right? They're, they're sort of the same thing. It's, it's how I justify being both a managing editor and an IA practitioner, mm. because in both cases, what you are doing is you are looking at a concept and then you are looking at how that concept is being translated into written language. And then you are looking at the effect of that written language on uh, an external user or reader, right? So it's, it's the exact same process in both cases. It's just that one of them is working with one individual author through the process of writing a book. And the other is working with teams of people through the process of building a website or, or building an experience or a product. But it, while the contexts are a little different, the critical thinking is kind of the same, right? The, the steps we take to, to work through that. So, you know, there's a lot in common there. There's a lot in common there. The, the tactics are different. The recommendations end up being, you know, the, the actual, we're not really, we're both, both are going to involve like, word choice, both are going to involve tone and voice, but, you know, making a sitemap is very different than making a, a book outline. So there are some differences, but it's very much the same way of thinking. Mm. And it, it seems that that critical thinking that's inherent in both of those tasks is the consideration, not just of the immediate decision, but of the impact of that decision on the people that we're creating things for. I want to play devil's advocate here, which could be dangerous. <laughs> uh-oh, uh-oh. Yeah, I know. I kind of pre-warned you that I might do this uh, <laughs> okay. before we hit record, right? <laughs> so if we, this is kind of just an interesting intellectual exercise, I feel anyway, you be the judge of that. So if we take this notion of doing no harm through our work as designers, and we apply that to the context of creating information architecture, and we take a liberal lens to whatever that may mean, right? I know I'm using big terms here and throwing them around, but say we take a liberally mm. minded lens to how our IA should be framed, but our audience is predominantly conservatively minded. Mm. Are we doing our users harm? <laughs> but, but if we're intolerant about intolerance, then we're really no better than the intolerant. Um, sorry. <laughs> So maybe this wasn't a good a good exercise. <laughs> what? I'm meeting you intellectually here. Okay. Um, no, it's. I, I think that's a good question, right? Like we we are trying to. The question you're really asking is, if we are really respecting our users, does that include like respecting our users' politics? But I think that that is sort of a mental exercise. I would be interested to hear about a real world application of that scenario. Like what is... Have, have you run into that? Have you no, run into that sort of tension? Yeah. I haven't. And so that's why I'm very interested. Like, is there is there a situation where you would be, where the organization creating the website would want one set of values and the users of that website would want competing sets of values? And I don't, I don't know how often that would happen. You might have an organization that, you know, I'm trying to think maybe there's like a nonprofit that has like an overtly political aim and they want to reach uh, people of opposite political persuasions in order to convince them otherwise. But in that case, I don't think that's an IA problem. I think there's like a larger, <laughs> there's a larger mission driven strategy problem there to figure out is that even, how does that even, how do you do that? <laughs> like how, how does that even work? Is that even something you should be doing? So I don't think there's such a thing as like my users are conservative, but I'm going to like sneak in some like pro abortion stuff into the site map. Like that's, <laughs> I don't think that happens. I'm not trying to like undermine your question. I'm just uh, curious about like, can we think of like a real world application where that would be the case? I think there are maybe situations where maybe if you're dealing with something that's not overtly political um, on a website, you're dealing with some information that, that maybe is, okay, let me try to think here. How about this? Government websites, right? Government websites. Because uh, government governments have to serve everyone. They have to serve everyone. They cannot serve just liberals or just conservatives. So your your website there has to has to include everyone. And yet everything we do is political. So your choices of labels, your categories, your site map, your navigation, all of this is going to somehow come out politically. I can imagine there being some tension there, right? Like maybe you're making a website for, ugh, I don't want to like stick my foot in my mouth because I haven't worked on any government websites before, but I'm trying to think if you're making a website for food stamps or something where maybe some conservative users would be upset with phrasing things a certain way or writing about things a certain way. Um, but I think in those cases, you have to do your best to 
to write your users in that case should be the people you're trying to help. Your users need to be the vulnerable group, right? The people who are trying to get the food stamps or, or whatever it is. You can't be worrying about the critics from the other side of the political aisle who are going to be upset with the way you phrase something. In, 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 if that is who you are trying to support and trying to reach, what you know? I guess that I would love to hear from someone who's dealt with that. <laughs> if they have experienced that tension, I would really like to hear about it. Well, if anybody has experienced that tension, please leave please. a comment on the video. We please. would be interested to hear what that was like. I would really I like I was, to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, because we, if we talk about our role, uh, well, a potential role for designers as, as agitating and, and being mm. an, an activist for things that are, again, this is like highly skewed, right? But things that have a positive impact for most people in the world, then there is that sort of, question that I think we all have to ask ourselves, which is, what's the, it could, it could be even a really small thing. What's the smallest thing I can do here to, yeah. to help to make that happen and bring that to bear. Now you've said, and I'm going to quote you now, uh -oh. that categorization has political and financial impacts because it has social impacts. When we label something, when we categorize something, when we group things together, we are making a statement on how we see those concepts. It also tells your users how you see them. Mm. And that was from your talk, Categories and Consequences. Mm. And you gave an example in that talk that I th thought was appropriate to bring up now because it sort of seemed to me to be unintentional, but it was of a bike website mm. that had made a questionable choice about its use of categories. What was that choice? <laughs> So I don't have that example in front of me, so I don't want to misquote it, but uh, I believe I believe there was a division of types of bikes, and we had things like uh, uh, off-road bikes and dirt bikes and women's bikes, so that clearly this company, the implication being that this company feels that bikes are for men, except when they're not. <laughs> Bikes, regular bikes are for, for men, but only a certain kind of bike is for women. Women are a kind of bike, essentially, uh, in this in this hierarchy of terms. Um, and they don't go off-road. They do not go off-road. They do not have any other purpose. They are only for women to ride. That is it. I mean, it's it's which is like insulting and offensive and weird, honestly, that you would think of your product that way, that you would think of having this range of types of products and then just like limiting it to this what limiting 50 percent of the population in the world to one category and the other 50 percent to these 10 categories why would you that just seems like a bad business decision well it just seems that they weren't thinking really were they <laughs> like, i mean or was it intentional i mean we're supposed we don't know but it just it just seemed to be uh, they like, probably weren't thinking they probably did not sit down to say how can we alienate 50 percent of the population that is probably not the the design decision they made they weren't thinking but that's this is this goes back to what i said a few minutes ago about how we do need to make sure that this kind of critical thinking is built into our process we cannot just assume that because we are well-intentioned or we are good people that the goodness is going to come out in the design the goodness is going to come out in the ia because it's not we're, we're, we're going to make women's bikes a category and that's how that's going to go. Yeah. And, and how much of this is going to persist to this decision making that we see evident in the experiences companies and organizations put out there like this? How, how much of this is going to persist until we have greater diversity represented at the leadership level and all throughout the organizations that we all work for and in? Yeah, I think that diversity within these organizations is incredibly important and absolutely is is one of the many things that need to happen um of course it's never just one thing it's it's never there's there's never just one cause there's never just one problem there's never just one solution it's always multiple of everything so diversity is is absolutely sorely needed inclusion is a larger effort uh that that goes into that as well because certainly we have seen we have seen products come out of teams that were perfectly diverse but not inclusive. So if your team has lots of representation, but that representation isn't being listened to or isn't being empowered 
or is being talked over or interrupted or talked down to or dismissed, like then that's not inclusive. And those voices, those perspectives, that diversity isn't actually going to make it to the final product. So diversity is part of it. Inclusion is part of it. Changing some systems, <laughs> like some larger systems, uh, getting, getting stronger leadership, making sure people aren't afraid to speak up, empowering people to protect themselves and to therefore be able to work. It, because it, part of it is, if you, going back to the very beginning of our conversation, if you are worried for your job, if you have insecurity around your role and your job, you can't empower users because you yourself are not empowered. If you are afraid that speaking up or making a change is going to impact you negatively at work, that's it. You can only look out for yourself. You cannot look out for a larger community. You cannot look out for your users. So part of making people feel more secure in their jobs means uh, dismantling capitalism. It means <laughs> unionizing. It means changing some of our social systems so that we have more security outside of our jobs. So there's there are larger systems that also have to be incorporated into this. Um, you know, we need we need more stronger leadership in governments. We need stronger leadership locally. We need it's all connected, which I hope comes across as hopeful and not overwhelming, right? Because it's like, oh God, I have to start thinking about government and mayoral elections. Yeah, sure. Uh, but it also means that there are many, many pieces. And so that's why, again, if you can make one change, if you can move one tiny piece that is contributing to this larger upflow that we need to see. I think that's a really important thing for people to have a think about. I want to segue slightly into something that's quite topical, given what happened yesterday with one of the world's largest social media platforms. Yeah. I don't want to necessarily address uh, that directly, but happy to see where, where things go. It was based off something else that I heard you say, and I'm just going to paraphrase now, which was that we, uh, as people, most of us are fairly reluctant to self-identify in a group setting, especially when it comes to things like citizen status, citizenship status, religious beliefs, marital status, health conditions, things like that. Mm -hmm. Yet we seem to face no discomfort when handing over that sort of information online and repeatedly to corporations and to government departments that we know very little about and about their intentions for that information that we're giving them. Why are we so uncomfortable in a public setting where we can eyeball other humans, yet seemingly so comfortable with the same thing and anonymous digital experience? <laughs> For the exact same reason that we are perfectly fine having road rage when stuck in traffic, but we would never shove someone over in line face to face. <laughs> you know, well, you say that, but someone in, in New Zealand <laughs> oh, just a few days ago sure. was some, something happened. It was a road rage incident, and that the person was murdered with an axe. Oh my axe. god! What an axe! I know in New Zealand, and yeah, with an axe, two gang members got out and murdered that person. And it's kind of shocked the the country, to be honest. Okay. So All anyway, right. I don't well, know why I brought that up, but, that's, uh, but you think that you think <laughs> there you go. Just be careful, people. This was you not the uh, this was not the metaphor I meant to uh, bring up then. <laughs> but no, I mean I, it's it's anonymity, right? Versus versus known context. So it is uh, just shockingly easy to throw ourselves into the void of the internet, where no one no one knows who we are. No one knows if we're a dog versus face-to-face -face in a room full of people who you can see, who can see you, it, suddenly we become a lot more guarded with our information. You know, we, we don't even think about really the information that is out there about ourselves. Full disclosure, you did a bunch of research on me before we started this call <laughs> and said things back to me about myself that I knowingly put out on the internet that I forgot, I guess, not forgot, but like just wasn't, it wasn't top of mind for these are things people can find easily about me because I put them there on purpose for people to find out about me. So it's not top of mind for people, you know, like what you put out in your profiles on LinkedIn, on Facebook or whatever, you forget my, my Twitter handle right now. Yes. It's, it's my Twitter handle is at red Sesame, but my uh, screen name is ham crystal in all caps. Why? Because it was a joke I saw somewhere and thought it was very funny and it amused me. It made me laugh. But the other day someone was like, why is your name Ham Crystal? And I was like, what? what? My name is what? I'd forgotten because I, I just don't look at, I'm not looking at my Twitter screen all the time. So it just didn't occur to me. We forget what we put out on the internet. We forget what's publicly available. We don't know how much these companies know about us. We don't know how much the government knows about us. We don't know how much Facebook is selling to someone else about us. 
But, you know, how much do I want my neighbor to know when I'm actually talking to them face to face? All of a sudden, it's very like, I would never introduce myself as Ham Crystal to someone in real life. So I don't know. Again, human nature, we're just funny about places where we feel like we're anonymous or or safe somehow. In an, is it safety, though? This is it, the thing that I'm wondering about as we're talking, you know, is this trust? You know, because I saw your Lens a Day yeah. episode with Dan Brown, and you picked yeah, yeah. trust as the lens uh, for looking at IA. And it was a yeah. great conversation. I recommend people check that out. And that got me thinking about, yeah, okay, so in design and IA, we're really trying to build trust. Mm -hmm with our users to feel comfortable and safe participating in whatever experience it is or product we're creating. But when it comes to the sort of mindless, mindlessly handing over our data, is it really trust that's underlying that? And if it's not, what do we do as IAs or designers to actually really make that a, tr a trusting or trustful relationship? I don't think it's trust when it comes to just share oversharing on the internet. I think it's hubris maybe. <laughs> <laughs> a combination of hubris and laziness. I think it's that we just we just feel protected in an in an anonymous setting, whether it's deserved or not, whether it's it's rational or not. The way that when we are in traffic, it's it's easier to honk our horn because we don't think people know who we are. You know, it's like have you ever? I, this has not happened to me, but I've heard of it happening to other people. Have you ever like cut someone off or honked your horn, and then like at the next traffic light, you realize that it's someone you know. And you feel bad about, you know, like I've, I've heard of this happening and it's like, all of a sudden we feel shame because we, oh, I didn't know it was someone I knew. I would never have done that because when we think it's someone we don't know or, and they don't know us, you know, we, we react differently. It's the same thing with online trolls. If you're anonymous, if there is no like identification there, it's very easy to sort of lash out because there are no repercussions. If no one knows who you are, there's no repercussions. Yeah. The social cost isn't there. Yeah. Social cost. Um, so uh, there was a second part to this statement. There was a, like, I had a second part to the answer and it's gone now. So <laughs> yeah, I was just back curious, to you. <laughs> like, as, as IAs and, and designers, like mm -hmm. how, how do we go about actively building a safe and trusting relationship through the experiences we're creating with the people that we are creating them for? Yeah, I think that's, that's the million dollar question really. Um, and it, I think it does vary case by case in terms of who your users are, what kind of um, marginalization they experience, what kind of company you are, what their browsing context is going to be like, uh, what your goals are. So there's going to be a lot of variety there, but I, I think that being respectful, like, tr like really treating users with respect, respect for their time, respect for their identities. It's everything from little things like providing more than two gender options in a form, right? To using language that is inclusive. Those are little signs that people look for to know, okay, do I feel like this is a website I can trust? Do I feel like this is an organization I can trust? Not everyone looks for those signs, but the people who need them do. Um, and so that's, again, important to think about who are the most vulnerable users you have and what can you do to make them feel safe? Because if, if they feel safe, the next level up that is less, slightly less vulnerable, they will feel safe. And the next level up until your safest users are, they're not even going to notice. So work for the, work for the most vulnerable <laughs> denominator there. Right. I don't know. That seems like common sense to me. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it makes a lot of sense. And I hadn't actually thought about that before you said that. So I really appreciate mm -hmm. you bringing that to the conversation and sharing that with the people that are listening. Mm -hmm. Lisa, thinking about the people who are listening, the people in this field that we love, mm -hmm and their potential to affect positive change. What is it that you want them to realize about themselves and that power that they have and that they possess? What is it you want them to know? That's a really good question. A few things, I think, and some of them we've said already, so I'll just reiterate. But one, they are more powerful than they realize, particularly if they maybe spend some time looking at, like, what kind of power you do have, like really interrogate that, interrogate your power, interrogate your privilege. If you feel secure in your job, if you are already in a union at your job, if you feel like you're in a position where there aren't going to be a lot of personal repercussions for speaking up, if you feel like you, if you're in a management position and you have direct reports, um, just, just examine that stuff. I'm not saying that means everyone in those positions uh, has ultimate power. I'm just saying like, look for what is where you are protected so that you can operate within those circles a little more effectively. So realize that you might have more power than, than you maybe realize at first. And that 
it is worth doing what you can, even if it feels like nothing, even if it feels too small, do something because that, that one little thing might really matter to someone one day uh, in a way you might not even know uh, or ever hear about, but like do it anyway. And then I think the, the final thing is, especially when we're feeling alone or especially when we're feeling like we don't have enough power, collaboration is really where, where this has to ha take us next. We, we have to band together, right? Like it is, it is, we are all like these individuals in this system. It's collective action that's going to like make the furthest push and the biggest change. So if you are a designer in, a, in an organization that doesn't have a union, think about that. How do we, how do we start making that happen? Um, if you are in an organization that doesn't actually align with your values, can you move to a different organization? Not everyone can, but if you can, maybe try putting, you, you're valuable, okay, is the thing. You are good at your job and you are valuable and you have talents and skills and you, those talents and skills deserve to go to a company who deserves them. So like if you are working for a less than great tech company right now, just know that there are a lot of other companies that also want to give you money for your work and maybe go work for them instead. That's my suggestion. If you can, if you can. Golden handcuffs are a thing and I understand that. So do what you can. Try, try, try some other places. Put your talents towards uh, folks who deserve it and try to just see what changes you can make to your internal workplace policies. See what changes you can make to your processes, your workflows. How can you improve things both for your your colleagues and coworkers, as well as for your users. So that was way more than one thing. Um, I just gave like four or five things, but they're all connected. <laughs> they're all connected. They're all about, they're all about increasing your power in ways that, that will benefit the larger whole, I think. So good luck folks. I hope everyone spends a little time reflecting on that and uh, reaches some, some new insights. I really like how you started that with a call to reflect on the power that you do have. I think that's a wonderful thing to give people uh, to think about and for people to to have a, have have some time to look at what they can do with whatever that power may be. Lisa, this has been a great conversation. It's certainly given me many, many, many things to think about, and I'm sure it's blown some minds in our audience as well in a good way. Thanks for so generously sharing those stories and insights with us today. Thank you so much for having me and uh, giving giving me the opportunity to to have this conversation. I, I really hope, I hope people take something positive from it, and I hope that uh, we all go on to do some good. So thank you for the airtime. Yeah, you're most welcome, Lisa. It was my pleasure. If people want to find out more about you and what you're up to, what's the best way for them to do that? Oh, I would usually tell folks to uh, follow me on Twitter, but I honestly am not looking in there too much these days. It's uh, kind of a shit show. I am on Instagram at Red Sesame. That's a good way to look at my personal life, I guess. Uh, professionally speaking, um, the best way to, to pay attention there is to um, check out A Book Apart at abookapart.com. Um, I'm the managing editor and uh, we are just trying really hard these days to put out books that um, are, are speaking to all of these values. Uh, and uh, hey, if you're uh, thinking about writing a book, please get in touch. We've got a, a new proposal system set up. So uh, we'd love to hear from you, especially if you uh, come from a, an underrepresented or marginalized group in tech. Um, and uh, I've got a, a new book coming out next year called You Should Write a Book about that topic itself. So uh, look oh. for that as well. <laughs> Oh, wonderful. Yeah, we'll have to get you back on when that's released. That'd be fantastic. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. And to everyone who's tuned in, it's been great having you here as well. Everything that we've covered, including where you can find Lisa, find a book apart and all the wonderful things that we've mentioned will be in the show notes on YouTube. If you enjoyed the show and you want to hear more great conversations like this with world-class leaders in UX design and product management, don't forget to leave a review, subscribe to the podcast, and also tell someone else about it if you feel that they would get value from these wonderful conversations. If you want to reach out to me, my LinkedIn profile will be in the show notes as well, or you can just find me on LinkedIn by typing Brendan Jarvis in the search. There's also a link to the space in between on the YouTube notes, so that's the space in between. .co.nz. And until next time, keep being brave. <laughs>